I've served on five ships, man. I have seen stuff. One time, I got trapped in a sentient cave for weeks. You ever been trapped in a sentient cave? That's a dark place that knows things. I almost got my head taken off by a singing crystal. I've been in a Klingon prison where I had to fight a Yeti for my own shoes for no reason. He was just being a dick. You've been on what? Four planets? Five, if you include Vulcan. Of course I don't include stupid Vulcan. You may as well count Earth. I was counting Earth. So I have an idea. I have an idea, Dan, and I think you're going to like this idea. Why don't we cover Star Trek Lower Decks as its own podcast sub-show to the flagship show? And we'll call it a Lower Decks review of Lower Decks. I like it. I like the idea. I feel like the name needs work. But yeah, you know what? Let's record it right now. Okay, let's do it. I'm going to hit the record button. Oh, wait. It was already recording. People are listening right now. Oh, my gosh. Welcome to Positively Trek. I'm Bruce Gibson with Dan Gunther. And, you know, this was an idea we've had long before just now. This was called acting. This is called improv. We were just (laughs) pretending that we just came up with this idea. But no, that was the intention all along because what we wanted to do is have our main show, as Dan calls it, our flagship show. And then we would have these other shows separate from it, the book reviews and episode movie reviews, whatever. And this is the first of that. And that's why Dan was very creative in using the yellow or gold bar in our show art. Yeah, just to kind of separate it. So yeah, this is kind of, this show plays the role that the USS Cerritos does. It's a support show to the flagship show. It's, you know, maybe the second contact show rather than the first contact show. (laughs) Yes. And the book show would be the third contact show because it's not canon. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I like that. (laughs) I don't know. But yeah, so that was the intent is to have this part of our releases of ep- of podcasts to cover Lower Decks week by week as episodes come out, which then will lead to Discovery, which then would lead to Picard or what other series, Prodigy, whatever else comes out. We will cover it here on this. And when there's not a new episode, then you're not going to get one of these sub shows. Or maybe you will get a sub show where we're covering a previous episode of an older Star Trek series or movie or something. Oh, that's cool, too. Yeah. Or or a movie, like you say, if, you know, Paramount ever gets its button gear and We get a new movie and wait, maybe that's a topic for the flagship show. I'll I'll hold on to that. Yeah. Hold on to that because we will definitely cover that in the next episode after this. Hmm. So the flagship show. Yes. But we do want to talk about second contact of Lower Decks. And unfortunately, from what I understand, it still hasn't been released internationally outside of the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, that's true. Now, there was some news on this where Mike McMahon in an interview said it was basically the COVID-19 crisis that's kind of delayed it because apparently Discovery was supposed to be airing right about now or even a little earlier and Lower Decks wasn't supposed to air until October or some time like that. But because it was moved up before a lot of these international agreements had been put in place that you know they expected would be done by October... Uh, They've had to kind of scramble and rush on that. And unfortunately, those aren't finished yet. So hopefully sometime soon that gets sorted. But unfortunately, that situation has led to that delay. Yeah. So this episode that we're recording right now is just a couple days after Lower Decks released. So if there's been news since the podcast dropped, we don't know about it because we can't predict the future. But hopefully we will get some information on international release. So just so you know, listening to this, we will get into spoilers. So if you haven't watched Lower Decks, whether you're in the U.S., Canada or internationally where it's not available, we're going to go into spoilers. So you may not want to listen to this. You may want to just jump ahead to our next episode where we're talking about, yeah, movies and other things. So, Dan, I have to ask you, you watched it the day it came out. Several times. <laughs> sev- how many times? Uh, three so far. Um, I'm doing one more pass at my Easter eggs review episode. So at least one more time with a lot of pauses. So that will take a while. <laughs> And when you say your Easter egg episode, you mean for your YouTube channel? 
Yes, that's right. So uh, for all the previous new episodes of series recently, I've been doing an Easter egg deep dive where I talk about Easter eggs and canon connections in the episode. And uh, yeah, I'm doing that for Lower Decks. And even though those episodes are shorter, my episodes, I think, will be quite a bit longer because there are a lot of Easter eggs in this. Okay, well, I want to cover some of those Easter eggs on this show, at least, because there may be stuff that you have found that I was not aware of. And I'm guaranteeing you that is going to be the case. I, too, have watched it three times. I watched it the morning it came out. My daughter had a oral surgery thing that she needed that morning. And I said, I must really love you if I'm taking you to the doctor before I watch Lower Decks. <laughs> and so when I got home, I watched Lower Decks. And then I watched it again that evening with my entire family who seemed to really love it. Now, just so people know, my daughters are 18 and 16. And my 18-year-old who's not a big Star Trek fan, but occasionally, occasionally watches with me, said, I said, do you want to watch it? She goes, yeah, like right now? I said, sure. And she's like, yeah, because, you know, Star Trek's cool, you know? I was like, oh, it is? Really? <laughs> Great. And I, she goes, well, my youngest is like, wait, what's it again? It's a cartoon. I said, yeah, like, you know, Rick and Morty, because the guy's like, wait, Rick and Morty? Yeah, okay, I'm definitely going to watch it. Nice. And, so they did enjoy it. And I'll talk about that as we go through just kind of their reactions to certain things. I never did ask my wife what she thought of it. I mean, I think she enjoyed it. But anyway, so yeah, I watched it three times and then I just watched it again before we're going to record. So Dan, what was your first impression going into this? Uh, or what was your thoughts going into it? And then what was your impression after seeing it? I think my thoughts going into it were th that I was a little worried. Uh, not Not worried, I guess, but... You know, from the trailers, it seemed as though it was going to be kind of off the wall, wall to wall comedy, just crazy hijinks from beginning to end, slapstick humor and that kind of thing. I had been told by some people that, you know, the trailer is not completely indicative of what the episodes are and that there are a lot more heart in them than it would seem. So, you know, I was kind of having that in mind. And then watching it, that was totally borne out. I really enjoyed this. I loved the characters. The humor I did enjoy. And I think that's the toughest part. Like humor is very subjective. Some people will love it. Some people will not like it so much. But for me, you know, most of the jokes worked. But beyond that, the characters really worked. And I really like their relationships and that sort of thing. I feel like this is the, this is the shortest pilot episode of a series with the exception of you know the animated series i guess but this one also had to introduce all of these characters plus have an interesting storyline and i feel like in less than a half an hour this episode kind of did that better than some first episodes of other star trek series have that are you know usually two hours long which you know to my mind is kind of incredible that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. Uh, we only have, I think the episode's about 26 minutes, and that's including the credits, so actual story is a little less than that. But it does a good job introducing the characters, but I also like that some of the characters have a history, and I think that can help in character development, because when there's already history between two characters or multiple characters, then you don't, it's not so much of introducing a character, you're learning the character just from the relationships. So mm -hmm. you've got some of that, which I think is helpful to it. And I agree. I think it does a really good job at introducing these characters to us for the first time. And especially when we see Tendi, uh, she boards the ship. She's that fresh perspective being new to the ship. And we're learning about the ship and the characters kind of through her eyes and being introduced to them through her. And again, they already have established relationships now with each other. So I enjoyed that, too. Yeah, I went into this also with, I'm not sure if I'm really going to like this that much or not. And I thought, well, it's not going to be my favorite Star Trek series out of all the series. I just know it won't. No matter how good it is. I don't think I'll ever think it's better than the original series or TNG or Deep Space Nine or whatever. But I was starting to have lower expectations. Because when I saw the clip of Boimler doing his captain's log and Mariner kind of coming in drunk and throwing him around. I didn't find it all that funny. I thought, okay, is this just really to be over the top stuff? Just not clever humor, just physical craziness 
nothingness, you know? And I was a little worried about that. And I thought, but, you know, I'll still, of course, watch it. I'll probably enjoy it somewhat. But I have to admit, when I watched it, the more it was going, the more I started laughing, the more I was enjoying the story, the characters. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I am really loving this right now. <laughs> and I think you felt the same way. Yeah, very much so. And, and I even think like on repeated viewings, my enjoyment of it went up with each time I watched it again, which, you know, isn't always the case. So I, I think that worked really well. I like your point about Tendi being kind of the audience surrogate and our first look at this ship and this show through her eyes. But I think it goes even beyond that a little bit. I feel like they used Tendi to introduce the whole concept of Star Trek very subtly. So those of us who are very familiar with Star Trek maybe didn't pick up on this as much, but upon repeated rewatches, I'm like, oh, they're introducing the idea of the holodeck. They're introducing the like all of these Star Trek things that we take for granted because I really feel like this series will be an in for a lot of people who've never watched Star Trek before. And like you say, your daughters, for example, and I've heard other people say like, oh, I've never really watched Star Trek, but I saw that trailer. That looks pretty funny. I like Rick and Morty. Maybe I'll check this out. So there are lots of people out there that I think this might be their first glimpse into that whole world. And if this can introduce them to, you know, TNG and Deep Space Nine and Discovery and all these other great shows, man, I'm, I'm that's awesome. <laughs> I did read somewhere online where someone was saying that their son all of a sudden started watching TNG or Deep Space Nine episodes after seeing Lower Decks because, you know, what are those Borg cubes? You know, that's exactly. The, <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> well, I guess he didn't know what they were board cubes or those cubes and stuff. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it's what are those Romulan to Deradex class warbirds? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, sounds like something you would say for the first time. I could see you being born, Dan. And the first thing you say is that. It's like, yeah, oh, it's, in, it's yeah, ingrained in him at birth. <laughs> <laughs> it's sometimes I, I, I feel like that sometimes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily want to go through every scene beat by beat. Uh, just We'll just kind of jump around some things that really stand out to us. But I did want to mention about the opening sequence and the music. I enjoyed that because there was a lot of things in there that felt very Voyager to me. And then the Cerritos flying over, which is kind of like an iceberg and kind of hits it or something that kind of made me think of Voyager from its opening and I also thought that the Star Trek font was the classic Star Trek font they didn't use the one they've been using for Discovery and Picard so mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting because I noticed they doing that in the promos but as we know with Picard it's somewhat changed from what you see in the actual episode versus what they're using in promotions yeah, that's true. And yeah, this one, it looks like the title is the same as what we've been seeing all over the internet. The other font, though, that they used just lifted straight from TNG from the credits, you know, yeah. all of the, you know, starring credits, they're all that that same font, that same color, right from Star Trek The Next Generation. Which, you know, I, I get that. I like it as an homage. I was kind of like, oh, they should do something unique. But I also get that they're trying to tie it to TNG. That's obviously Mike McMahon's favorite iteration of Star Trek. You know, we saw him do the TNG season eight Twitter account and the book. So, you know, we know that's his love. So that makes sense. The music, it's interesting. All of the new themes that we've gotten, like Discovery and Picard, I remember sticking in my head really quickly after hearing them. For some reason, I have a hard time remembering the Lower Decks theme. And, you know, it'll take a few watchings before it gets kind of imprinted on my brain. But part of that, I'm wondering, is because the very beginning of the theme, if you listen to the, like the first note and how it sounds, it sounds like the beginning of the TNG theme. And then the next couple notes sound like they're from the original series theme. And then the next few notes after that are directly from the animated series theme, which I think is brilliant. Uh, so maybe it's when I'm trying to remember the music, my brain just kind of shifts into those themes and I can't like grab the lower decks theme. But, you know, it's one I have to listen to a few more times to really remember it. Yeah, I was listening to it this morning and it was the first time I really was listening to the music and I enjoy it. It 
it, I don't want to sound, uh, I don't want to downplay it too much, but it sounded very standard Star Trek type music that you would kind of expect. It didn't sound too original, but I think that's also the point of the series. It's playing off of past Star Trek. And I feel like even that's what the music's doing, even to your point of borrowing from different series, even the animated series to play in there. But then even just visually how things start off, you're like, okay, this is like other Star Trek series. There's the ship in space, but then it gets hit by asteroids and its power goes <laughs> out and you know, then it's got to fly back around and then it there's the Borg cubes and it flies away from the Borg and that's the best part of the opening credits. <laughs> they just <laughs> nope right out of there. <laughs> I like to think Oh, we're second contact. We're not needed here. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I enjoyed the opening, and uh, then we get into the episode. And there's something I noticed this morning, and I, okay, here's the problem, Dan, with CBS All Access, and I know you don't watch on CBS All Access where you live. The problem with CBS All Access is if I go to pause it in the browser, it shrinks down to a thumbnail. Mm. I can't I can't pause the screen to look at stuff. It shrinks down. Oh, that's frustrating. Yeah. I can't I can't remember if it's like that on the app. I think it might do that on the app too, but I typically watch it on my computer because I'm sitting here taking notes. At the beginning when they're in the shuttlecraft, in the very back, I see an officer in gold. It looks like he's wearing a turban. Mm-hmm. Yeah, TrekCore actually featured this, like a, a close up on him. And yeah, it is as far as I can remember, the first Star Trek Starfleet crew member we've seen wearing a turban, which is really cool. So there's a Sikh crew member in the shuttle bay there. Which I am thrilled about because I have often said, and I don't know if I ever said this on a podcast, but I, when I talk about it with people, I keep saying that I want to see the crew look more international. And I'm like, you know, I'd love to see a crew member with a turban on. And I've never seen that. And when I saw it in the background, I was like... <gasps> No, finally, are we seeing this, you know, <laughs> but it was, I, yeah, I was thrilled about that. So that, that made my day this morning for sure. Exor of course, besides talking to you, that made my day too. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm thrilled about that as well. It's great to see, like, it does feel like Star Trek gets very American centric. And I have to admit, I was a little worried about that with this series, more than any because, you know, the, the ship is named after a city in California. The shuttlecraft are all named after California state parks or national parks. We'll, we'll get to that, I'm sure. Uh, you know, and it, it just feels like, oh, this is very not just American centric, but like where they've made Star Trek centric. But, you know, it looks like they're they're trying to do things that make that a little bit more international, which I appreciate. That's one thing that bothered me about something Jason Isaacs said when he was playing Lorca on Star Trek Discovery, because he has an English accent, but he played the character with an American Southern accent. And in an interview, he said, well, we already had a captain with an English accent, so I wanted to change it up because I didn't want to sound like Picard. And I thought, yeah, but we've also had captains with American accents, multiple ones. <laughs> <laughs> we can have multiple captains with English accents. <laughs> I've always wondered if there's a little bit more to that than he said, because like in Hollywood, there's this tradition of making bad guys have British accents. Like that's just a thing. Like you need somebody who's a European bad guy and it doesn't matter if he's from Russia or France or wherever, he's going to have a thick British accent. So I always wondered if he did that just to be like, I don't want to be another villain with a British accent. Like I want to, you know, make him a Southerner American with just a little bit of a twang to it or something instead. And not to open Pandora's box, we won't get into this, but I also heard that that was kind of a concern when they were doing Star Trek Into Darkness of having Khan looking dark Middle Eastern Indian as being a terrorist. Mm. And they were worried mm -hmm. about that perception of, oh, okay, yeah, he's that color. He's from that region of the planet. So of course he's a terrorist. And I heard that was a concern. And that's why part of the reason they went with Benedict Cumberbatch. But anyway, that's a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> that's on a future movie a podcast episode that we're gonna, we'll do someday. So yeah, talk about the shuttlecrafts. Those shuttlecraft names are after parks in California, which the Cerritos is a California class starship. Yeah, that was kind of neat because that 
that particular scene you're talking about with the Sikh crew member, if you look behind him, the part they've zoomed in on Trek Corps, and, uh, you know, they've had a lot of comments about this because behind him, you see just the front of the shuttle kind of poking out and it just says death. <laughs> you're like, what the heck? <laughs> What's the name of that shuttle? But yeah, no, that shuttle is called the Death Valley. Uh, the shuttle that Tendi arrives on is the Yosemite. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. That's Yosemite. Oh, come mm-hmm. on, Dan. You're smarter than that. Yeah, I can't imagine why I made that mistake. Wow, crazy. Huh. Anyway, uh, the other <laughs> two, we have the Redwood and the Joshua Tree, which is really cool. So I, I don't know if we'll see more shuttlecraft than those four, but uh, those were the four names that appeared in this episode. I thought that was really neat. Yeah, I like all those little attentions to details, which is amazing to me when you see somebody online say, all the writers don't get Star Trek. Really? They don't? Okay. (laughs) Whatever. So now at this point, then, we have Tendi meeting Mariner and Boimler, and we're taking a tour of the ship. We go to the holodeck, which I really thought the holodeck was a nice scene, too, of them being on a Hawaiian beach. And I have to ask, because every time I've seen that scene, and Tendi's like, oh, this is sand? Or what is this? And Boimler's like, yeah, it's sand. It's I forget what he says, but it's like itchy or something. I'm like, is this a knock on Star Wars? It totally is. Because line, like word for word, he said it gets everywhere. Like that's what yeah. Anakin says. And then he says, and it gives you a rash. <laughs> Which <laughs> I, I love that. It was like, really? Gives you a rash? It doesn't do that to anyone else. Oh, it always does that to me. Poor Boimler. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and then we did get confirmation that Tendi is Orion, which, mm-hmm. I mean, we pretty much figured out. But as on a previous episode, when I was reading things about the characters, there was no mention that she was Orion. So I wasn't even sure if she really was or not. But we did get confirmation, especially here on the holodeck, because she brings up her home planet. And, uh, of course, Boimler says, you know, what would really be exciting is the warp core. Oh, the best place on the ship. The, the <laughs> coolest thing about the ship. The warp core. I I love this guy. He's such a dork. (laughs) (laughs) Just like us. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Here's the thing. When you're studying an episode and you're looking for Easter eggs, it's kind of unnerving when you have to just really study the all nude Olympic training facility. And I'm staring (laughs) at naked men's butts going, is there something there I should notice? (laughs) Well, It is a very detailed program. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Yes, it is. So let's talk about the relationship of these characters. So Boimler and Mariner, what did you think of their relationship throughout this episode? I think it's interesting. I like that they've been serving together for a year. They're not exactly like friends at the start of the episode. And I love that even over the course of this 20 minute, 20 plus minute episode, there's a character arc for the two of them, you know? And I I think there's some really interesting things being set up kind of obviously, I think what's going to happen is, you know, Boimler is going to influence Mariner to kind of smooth out some of her rough edges and make her more into kind of a model Starfleet officer But on the flip side, Mariner is going to influence Boimler and make him a little bit more eager to, you know, jump into new situations and a lust for life that he's kind of missing right now. And we even see that over the course of this episode, you know, at the beginning, he's so nervous and so like winning, wanting to do anything to make the senior staff happy. And by the end, He's correcting the captain on how his name is pronounced. Like early episode Boimler would not have done that. I thought that was just a nice little nod to like the influence these two characters are going to have on one another. And like you said, they've been on the ship for a year together. And I mentioned how these characters have history, but they don't have a rich, deep history with each other. It's almost like they've been acquaintances on the ship. They kind of know each other, but... In this episode is when they really form a bond of like, we're going to be close. We're going to be friends. Hey, Boimler, I'm going to be your mentor. Woo! I'm going to take care of you. You're pretty cool. And we find out more about Boimler's relationship with the captain, which tells me that since the captain didn't get his name right, he has been on the lower deck and she hasn't noticed him for a year until she needs him for something. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, basically sees like, oh, this guy's been hanging out with Mariner. I can use him, you know. 
Yeah. And then, and of course we said there'd be spoilers in this, but that's the thing we start to discover towards the end of the episode that Mariner is the captain's daughter. Yeah. Which like this reveal, I feel like was really well done because it's kind of one of those things that like when you realize it, you're like, oh, of course I should have realized that earlier, but I didn't, you know, earlier on, I was just kind of like, why is the captain taking such a weird interest in this one ensign? You know, it seems very odd. And even then I was like trying to think like, why, why would she be doing that? That's really strange. But the episode is so fast paced. You don't really have time to stop and think about that until we get that reveal towards the end. And like I said, I think that was really well done. Because early on, I was thinking, oh, I think that Mariner must have some weird past, you know, Mm -hmm. which I still think is the case because she's been transferred from another ship to this ship. But I just thought it was almost like a Burnham type situation where this officer's on the ship and the captain's like, I need to keep an eye on her because of her past. And now we learn, well, there is a past, but it also involves the fact that they're related and the captain is married to an admiral who she's calling and she's like, your daughter, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, we have a whole family aspect to this. So it should be interesting. Yeah, that was good. I want to see more of the father and I'm assuming we will. I'm assuming he's probably Admiral Mariner is my guess. And, you know, they haven't said his name, but he seems really cool. I like, uh, oh, gotta go. Admiral stuff to do. <laughs> She's like, don't you dare. Don't you dare. Cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> I love this family dynamic. I think it's, you know, I want to see like a reunion dinner with all of them around the table and how awkward that would be. I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure that's going to happen at some point. Well, I also like how we see Mariner and Boimler really develop that relationship with each other when they're down on the planet there in the Galor system, when he thinks that she's taking weapons to the Galor Dorians. And I said, just like the guy did Galor Dorians. <laughs> he, and uh, he confronts her. Aha. I knew you were up to something bad. And it just like goes from there. And then we have that spider cow thing. That's what Boimler calls it. A spider cow thing. And I, cause I kept thinking, what is the name of this creature? And that was the only reference we had to it. So I had to go on Memory Alpha. And yes, sure enough, it is listed Spider Cow in there. <laughs> so Brilliant. I, guess, I love it. That's the canon name right now. <laughs> <laughs> I would have gone one fe- step further and say Spider Cow Thing. That's what I would have officially <laughs> listed it as. But I like it. Um, yeah, this was a scene that like from the trailers, I was kind of the most worried about that. Like I wouldn't really be digging the, this kind of slapstick humor kind of stuff, but I actually really enjoyed this scene, especially given the fact that he's not in any real danger, which makes that trailer make more sense now when she's like, Oh, you got this. And, and he's being thrown around by this thing. Uh, (laughs) she's just sucking on him for some moisture. (laughs) (laughs) That cracked me up. And it made my daughters laugh, too. They were laughing a lot at that. Oh, that's awesome. But make sure to don't phase her. her. You'll spoil the milk. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he's just suckling you. You'll be okay. (laughs) (laughs) And before that, he's like, he's shooting uh, butt webbing. (laughs) At the trees. Yeah, he seems mad. Um, I, I do like when she finally gets tired out and Mariner kind of pulls Boimler out of her mouth and boimler at this point is just like broken (laughs) he's like but i'm naked (laughs) he's just crying and i'm like oh poor guy yeah you know you you deserve uh you deserve a timeout poor guy (laughs) i have to say i did think about you in this part of the not the naked part but (laughs) earlier in these (laughs) scenes when they're driving the the car with the from nemesis the Argo, yeah. The Argo, yeah. Because we talked about that in a previous episode when you were studying all the screenshots from the trailer and you said that they had this little Argo on the uh, schematics of the ship. The most useless vehicle to have on a spaceship, an open air buggy that, you know, 
you can only drive on class M planets and doesn't have a ton of cargo space, but you know, they, I, I got to admit, they actually used them fairly well here. And I'm like, okay, I can see a role for these vehicles other than just hot rotting around a desert looking for Android parts. So yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Maybe we'll get an appearance of captain Picard visiting a ship and he'll get to drive one again. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> what one thing that I really laughed at with the spider cow thing is when it first made its appearance and they started running from it and Mariner yells, run idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that just really started to make me laugh. You know, and that's the thing. I was like, I'm sure I'll find this humorous, but I don't know if I'll really laugh out loud, but there were several times like that where I did laugh out loud. The first thing I laughed out loud was the Olympic training facility. That was the yeah. very first one. That was pretty good. I I love Tendy's reactions to stuff. And yeah, it was, you know, wow, this program is really detailed. <laughs> I just, I love that. <laughs> yeah, me too. So what'd you think about the whole zombie aspect of this? You know, what I liked about it was that it was just so like tropily Star Trek. Like it was just like, oh, this is a plot we've seen a hundred times, not necessarily a rage virus zombie thing, but like a virus running amok on the ship and causing crew members to behave crazily or whatever. But it was also like not the A story. It was just kind of happening in the background most of the time. Yeah. And the way that it allowed the senior staff members to kind of illustrate what Mike McMahon was talking about when he was first taught talking about what the series is about where they think the episode is about them but it's really not so like there's one scene in particular where boimler and mariner in in the background and the captain is talking to the doctor and the camera camera in quotes keeps focusing like on them but then focusing on the background and, and changing focus and the captain is like Doctor, can you find a cure? It's just such a Shatner <laughs> delivery as well. But in the background, Boimler and Mariner are like, ah, this is our show. What What's going on here? Right. And then the senior officer's show ends. Did you catch this? Where yeah. they're like, yeah, the doctor is like, uh, or, or they said, oh, you can write another award winning paper, doctor. Great. More paperwork. And they all do like the end of a TOS episode. Like, ah, <laughs> and they leave and like that's the end of their episode but no we've got more to do with with the main characters the lower deckers i love that i was like that's brilliant yeah yeah you're right i hadn't really thought about that way but you're right yeah it kind of ends with them their episode is over but no we're not done because this is a lower decks and even mariner's like uh hello you know, this is the guy that really saved you. Don't forget him. The, you know, the guy with the slime, you know, which I love the slime, <laughs> by the way. I love how we discovered that the slime is the thing that's going to be the cure. And uh, the captain's even like, you know, who? Him? And and Dr. Tan is like, he's important. Well, he's not, you know, but the slime. <laughs> <laughs> Protect that slime. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then when they get to sick bay, Lieutenant Shax just like dumps him on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of Dr. Tiana, I thought that was interesting, too, because the name is Tiana. But when we watched the live uh, Comic-Con thing, they said Tana. Yeah, it's very subtle. So Mike McMahon, it sounded like he said Tana, but it's yeah. Tana. There's just like a tiny little break in there, Tana. Which so. is what we thought it would be the way it's written with the little apostrophe after the yeah. T. Yeah, I, th- uh, I think I initially thought it was actually Tiana, but it, oh, yeah, Tana, yeah. but... Yeah, I okay, of the of the main main of the senior officers, I love her. <laughs> I Me think too. she's great. I love that they bleep her swears. Like there's just like she doesn't care. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> they bleep her swears, but they don't bleep it from Discovery and Picard. But I think it's no, funny with the yeah. bleep in this show, you know? And it's funny because after we watch this, then my youngest daughter's like, I'm in the mood for Rick and Morty, and she started watching Rick and Morty. And there were bleeps in there. I was like, hmm, it does seem the same. <laughs> no, they're, they're definitely going for a particular tone. And I, I think they've hit it. I really like it. Yeah, I do too. And going back to the planet real quick, I, there's one thing I wanted to mention that I really liked is when Mariner says to Boimler, take off your pants. And he's like, oh, Mariner. <laughs> <laughs> Something about his reaction there. I, I really love that as well. <laughs> 
The other thing that we haven't talked about is the dating aspect of this episode with Rutherford and the Trill officer. And I didn't ask my daughters about this, but based on their reaction, I think this is their favorite storyline of the episode because they were really reacting to them, especially when they were in, I guess it's their 10 forward. Is I don't even know if that's what they call it. That, did they call it that? or I don't They know just called it the bar. They called the it bar. the bar at one point. So when they're in the bar... And uh, the zombies start breaking out and all the fighting's going on. And they're still like, hey, you know, what what level, where's your quarters or whatever they're talking about. <laughs> and my daughters are just cracking up laughing at that, you know. And then when they're at one point out on the ship and they float by the window with all the violence going on inside, and they just float by holding hands. They were laughing at that. They just thought the whole thing was funny, even in the turbo lift. When she kisses him, they all, they both were like, oh, ooh, and he's just like, yeah, but what about the maintenance and this, you know, the the doors and all that stuff? And why didn't it recognize her <laughs> comm badges? And they just thought that was hilarious. I think, honestly, that might have been my favorite part of the episode, too. I really enjoyed the the di- the dynamic between these two and, like, with everything going on and them still carrying on their date, like you know, realizing they're touching hands and like, oh, ooh, shyly backing <laughs> away and all that kind of stuff, you know, and then it's perfectly illustrated at the end when Tendi asks him like, oh, no, did the rage virus ruin your date? And he's like, oh, no, that stuff happens all the time. You know, <laughs> like this is just like a weekly occurrence on a Starfleet ship, which, you know, if you've been paying attention, yeah, it's stuff like this happens every week. It's fine. Whatever. Um, But yeah, the fact that all of this is happening in the background and then that last bit where she kisses him and he's like, you're not even like concerned that a red alert overrode the door thing so that it wouldn't recognize our comm badges. And he's like telling this to Tendi and Tendi is like, wait, what? It did what? Oh my God. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) That's so great. (laughs) <laughs> They're so Starfleet, you know. It's about the ship. It's about the technology. That's what's important. Not the totally. relationships. This this explains why we haven't seen that many relationships on these starships. Because, you know, a relationship is nice, but let's focus on the tech and the mission first. That's what Trike and Roy have been doing for 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said Triker and Roy, by the way. <laughs> Did I say Triker and Roy? Yes. Did I really? Yeah. That is the weirdest thing. Because, <laughs> you know, you, you ship them together and uh, Triker, Triker or Roy. There you go. <laughs> I've been doing too many shipping. It's like just falling into my natural conversations now. <laughs> I was like, I'll just let that one slide. Then I was like, wait, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with me? I love that's, it. I love that's it. It's so weird. It's so weird. Well, let's get all serious now that we had a laugh. <laughs> What was the meaning of this episode, Dan? What is the the Ooh. real meaning behind all of this? Yeah, that's a really good question and I and I think the meaning could really be found in the bar- <laughs> just the Bariner Moimler storyline. Uh, <laughs> the Mariner Boimler storyline. And you know, we we get this idea from Star Trek that like the senior officers are the most important and what they do is the, you know, the be all and end all. And we get that final captain's log, right? Thanks solely to the efforts of my valiant senior officers and Boimler's rolling his eyes in the background. And I I think the meaning of this episode is how the people that make things work, the, the, in this case, the lower deckers in our society, maybe the quote unquote essential workers and things like that the people that really make society work are often overlooked in the day-to-day operations of, of making things work well and, and making things go forward. And, you know, maybe that's a bit of a cheat because I feel like that's kind of going to be a message of the series as a whole. But I think that really came across in this episode. Similarly, I think maybe also the idea of bureaucracy getting in the way of doing what's right with Mariner delivering these uh, farming supplies to the Galadorians or whatever 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, that Starfleet bureaucracy would hold them up. And in the meantime, these farmers would starve. She sees that and decides to do what she feels is right and bypass that. And that idea that, you know, maybe what's legal or what's by the book isn't always the right thing to do. Yeah, that's a good point. I, that's what I picked up too. It's the by the book. How much by the book do you have to be? And this goes back to classic Star Trek of do you break the prime directive at certain aspects of situations that are going on? And what's the right thing to do? Maybe it's not about following the rules, but following the rules, but then sometimes you got to break them or bend them a little to do the right thing in the moment. And Boimler's trying to catch Mariner on that, thinking she's doing the wrong thing and he's doing the right thing. And yes, he is doing the right thing if she's selling technology or weapons to this alien race on second contact. But she was actually doing it for the right reasons. And he's come to understand that and realizes that she is a good person. And you have to watch out for those good people and those people who now become your friends. And when a captain's trying to set it up to try to get Mariner on something for some reason, Boimler decides not to call her out on it. And he protects her and, and doesn't take that to the captain. And that's where this friendship begins. If she had been doing something wrong, he definitely would have said something to the captain. But it's about doing the right things. And yeah, bending the rules. Sometimes you have to do that to do the right thing. So I want to do the right thing and lightly touch on some Easter eggs that you have found, Dan. Ooh, well, I've got a couple pages. Uh, so I, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll maybe limit it a little bit. Because what you'll probably cover it all on your YouTube channel. That's the plan. These videos are going to be very long. But yeah, one thing I noticed is, of course, the many different alien species in the background. And we've gotten, uh, you know, a couple of Ryans. We have some Vulcans. Did you notice the Benzite? The guys with the little breather things there? Yes. Uh, there's even a Napian in one scene. Uh, in the transporter room, he's in the deep background pushing a, a crate. Now, Napians have only been seen in one episode of Star Trek before. And, and uh, I think it was Lieutenant or Ensign Daniel Kwan, who was half Napian, was in the episode Eye of the Beholder in season seven of TNG. So there, there's a deep cut for you. <laughs> I love that. Now, did you do that off the top of your head? Or did you have to look up that episode? I I. I knew that one off the top of my oh, head. Oh, yes. See, this is why Dan's on the show. <laughs> uh, why? Why? Why does this take up so much room in my brain? I don't understand. I don't know. Honestly, I feel like it's so interesting. You know what? It's like the human brain is so interesting to me because you retain that kind of information and I don't. I mean, it's just like it would not. I, would, I don't know how you remember stuff like that. And I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I mean, I want to be able to do that, Dan. I bow down to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're not sure if you want to take that as a compliment or not. I, I, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that uh, I actually didn't notice, and this had to be pointed out by others online. Did you notice the Nomad space probe in this episode? I did not, but I saw that mentioned online too. Oh, man. I was like, okay, well done. I, I've had to like insert it into my notes in the correct place. That was amazing. So yeah, at the very beginning in the supply closet where Boimler is recording his fake captain's log, leaning against the wall on the left-hand side, and you might have to actually turn up your brightness really to see this clearly, is that uh, you can see the bottom of Nomad from the TOS episode, The Changeling, leaning against the wall there. So like, that's cool. That's a deep cut. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. I remember seeing something where there's a smi a smiling Vulcan somewhere. Yes, there is. I did notice that, and I thought that was interesting. And I I immediately was like, oh, it's a mistake. But then I was like, wait, no, there's a diverse crew. You never know. In the literary verse, we have uh, Lieutenant Teresa Chen, who's yes. half Vulcan, but, you know, looks like Spock, because Spock's half Vulcan as well. But she's embraced her human half, as opposed to Spock, who embraced his Vulcan half. So, yeah, smiling Vulcan, you can have that, I guess. Yeah, why not? I mean, we also have a Vulcan that gets some of that goo, that black goo from the zombies on his face, and he looks like the mere Spock. Yep, I caught that. That was pretty, uh, pretty front and center there. I was like, oh, that's that's cool, yeah. 
<laughs> what else do you got? I'm curious. Well, one that I noticed was all the different glasses in the bar. All of the glasses <laughs> that we see are ones that we have seen in like 10 forward on the next generation. And also the waiters uniforms are yeah. exactly the same as the waiters uniforms in 10 forward, which, you know, is a nice touch. Yeah. I'm hoping that in an episode, somebody orders something green. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another thing that I thought of, you know, the monkeys are now canon in Star <laughs> Trek, which is kind of yes. cool. And I joked about this with Brandy on, we, we did a live show on my YouTube channel as well. I wonder if there's some sort of space time anomaly thing now with Chekhov because he was kind of modeled to look like Davy Jones from the monkeys. So yes. is that a thing now? Hmm. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that part. Uh, but now that you mentioned about the monkeys, that series was on at the same time that the original series was on. They were both, I think they both started the same year in 66. So huh. yeah, I think it's cool that they worked in the monkeys into this. Let's just say I'm a believer. <laughs> <laughs> I bet my kids didn't get that. I'll have to ask them. Maybe they did. I'll have to ask. Hmm. So I also noticed one other thing is the visors. I think we saw two different crew people wearing visors. Yeah, there were at least two people, two different people with visors. Uh, one you can notice right when Tendi arrives on the ship at the beginning. Uh, and there's an, you can see another one in the transporter room towards the end of the episode. And I think you see one or the other of them at some point partway through the episode as well. You know, I have to mention one thing, though. Uh, first of all, I always thought Jordy was probably the only one with visors, but I guess not, which makes sense that there'd be other people. But fast forward to the end when Mariner starts calling out all these historical or even prominent current day figures in Starfleet. And she starts saying, have you ever heard of Spock? What about Khan and, and the Genesis wave and, and the whales? And, you know, she starts going on that whole list. I was like, okay, that's fun. And then she says, what about Gary Mitchell? And I was like, Boimler at this point was saying, yes, yes, yes. He's heard of all these things. And when she said Gary Mitchell, my first reaction was like, oh, come on. He went, Gary Mitchell did not have anything that significant that a hundred years later, Boimler would probably know who Gary Mitchell was. And I love how he's like, uh, I'm sure I can look him up somewhere. I was like, thank you. I was like worried that he's like, of course I've heard of Gary Mitchell. I'm like, what? Everybody's watching episodes of TOS in the future. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And, and I love that it's another hint that Mariner is a lot smarter or at least knows a lot more than she lets on. And another one earlier in the episode is where she quotes regulations that Boimler doesn't. And Boimler's like, okay, great. You know more regulations than me. Like there's so much more to this character than meets the eye. She's a lot smarter than she lets on. So what character are you in the show? Which one are you closely identified with? Oh, man. I, I would honestly have to say I'm a bit of a mix, I'd say, between Tendi and Boimler. Like yeah. I have that kind of wide eyed, like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I can't believe all this uh, mixed with like the nervousness and the like wanting to please people and that sort of thing. I, I think that's where I am. Yeah. How I about was, you? I'm the smiling Vulcan. I'm just kind of in the background, <laughs> just watching and smiling. <laughs> no, I would say I'm probably more of the tendy in a sense. Mm -hmm. I'm probably like you, you know, say a mixture of Boimler and Tendi, you know? Well, maybe even Mariner. Actually, no, now I'm thinking about even more. I'm probably even a little more like Mariner, <laughs> you know? <laughs> if, you're, if you talk to people at work, they probably say more like Mariner. Well, I will steer clear of you if there is a rusty Batleth around because that did not look fun. <laughs> no, I would never do that, though, for sure. Yeah. Maybe I'd be more like, some days I'm uh, Dr. Tiana, for sure. <laughs> All right, so I guess that concludes this episode of our review of Second Contact of Lower Decks. I would say that we both would give this a thumbs up, but, uh, you know, do we want to give a rating? I don't know. I, you know, even on the live show when we recorded, I didn't give a numerical rating. My rating on the show was I look upon this episode the same way that Boimler looks upon the warp core. That was my rating for the episode. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> I think that's a great way to end. I agree with you on that. 
So yeah, join us next week. We release these episodes on Monday. So look for them in your podcast feed or just go online and uh, pull the episode off. And then the next day on Tuesday is our flagship show. So that's coming up next. So Dan, if somebody wants to find you online, where will they find you with your Easter eggs? Well, you can find me on youtube.com slash Kurtratz Productions. That's where I'll be putting out video reviews of the episodes and Easter egg videos and other Star Trek news and that sort of thing. I'm on Twitter at Kurtratz, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. And you can find me in the Positively Trek discussion group where I'll be posting links to all of these things because, you know, I think you find people need to get your eyes on them and, and check out all these things and you know, there's always really cool discussions and posts happening in that group. And, you know, more people have been joining, but we want even more people in there. I, I want that to be like the premier Star Trek discussion group on the Internet. Well, you're definitely busier than I am online because you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. And that's all I can think of right now. I mean, I occasionally do stuff at the Star Wars Report podcast, but I know that I'm doing something in a few weeks, I'll try to get some more information. That is a online podcast live, I think, charity event of podcasters. Mm. And I think I'm going to be involved in that. And you guys all know as much as I do right now. <laughs> I just know what I just said. I don't have any details, but I'll give more details on that later. If you guys want to hear me live talking Star Wars, something, I don't know what it is. But anyway. In the meantime, I'll be watching Lower Decks for sure.